Okay, guys, we're going to get started. Thanks for coming. Um, so this class today, this is normally part of a, a seminar that we're teaching on the Global Street Design Guide in the Urban Design Program, where we have mostly urban design students and a few from the planning program. Um, looking at how, how do we kind of rethink our urban streets around the world. And so we're thrilled today because the godmother of all of the work that we've been doing uh, as part of the Global Street Design Guide is Jeanette Sadek Khan. And Jeanette used to be the commissioner for the transportation department here in New York under Mayor Mike Bloomberg's term. And she's currently a principal at Bloomberg Associates and our chair at NACTO and the Global Designing Cities Initiative. Um, and of course, Jeanette is also the author of this really awesome book, Street Fight. And so we've invited her here today um, to speak to you guys. Hopefully in the future we can do it in the evening because we know there's a clash um, with many people's classes. So you guys are the lucky few that we've picked a slot that works for your schedule. Uh, and so please, I'd like you to join me in wel welcoming Jeanette to talk about Street Fight today. Huh? It's right here. Yeah, that's fine. It's great to be here with all of you and back at Columbia, which is my alma mater. I actually went to the law school and it was great training uh, for being a transportation commissioner. Now you might ask why. And that is because when you are making change in the world, there are so many times when like a lawyer will tell you, uh, no, I don't think we can do that liability concerns, or I don't think we can do that, we're going to lose federal money. And so if you are properly armed and trained and you know exactly what's possible within the envelope of your world, you can be a very dangerous person. And so um, I was very grateful for that training at Columbia, which I think made me a much better uh, commissioner. So before I start, I really want to recognize the 4,500 men and women at the New York City Department of Transportation because they were the ones that actually made the change happen that I'm going to talk about on the ground. And in particular, that guy on the right, Seth Salamano, who is my press secretary, my uh, co-author, and also my colleague at Bloomberg Associates. And as many of you know, when you make changes, you know, it can be controversial. And so having a really smart, savvy, press secretary, it was critical in terms of uh, what we were able to get done. So I'm going to start with a question. What do you all think about when you think about a street? I mean, this is a question I'm asking you. Yeah. The purest public space that we still have. <laughs> well, that's a really profound answer. That's never the answer I get when I ask this question. What else do you guys think about? Cars. Transit. Transit? That's good. Pedestrians. Pedestrians. Bikes. Asphalt. Asphalt. Safety. Safety. Furniture. Furnitures. Well, you are in New York, so we did a little bit of that. Um, most people think of a scene like this, right? And streets are what make some cities great and some cities not so great. But until recently, people have taken a sort of dashboard view of our streets, right? And our leaders have looked at streets like this and said, you know, yep, all this is working just fine. And streets, as you know, can be lively places for people. But for most of the last few generations, they've really been places for cars with devastating results. 40,000 people dying every year on our streets. Chronic congestion, lifeless streets. And this didn't happen by chance. This actually happened by design. And you look at a street like this, and you don't even see anybody walking there, right? That's not designed for them. Where would you even walk to? And it reminds me of this video game I used to play. Anybody play Frogger, right? I think that this game could have been called Pedestrian. And this is a real life translation. There are all sorts of signs of how a street wants to be used. And you can see here, you know, with these people stranded, you know, on the side of the road. And a big reason for that is our federal design standards, which dictate everything from the size of the fonts on our signs to the width of our streets. And this guide is like the Ten Commandments in transportation, but 500 pages long. And as you can see, they have spared no cost in clip art, right? So 
the other piece about this book is you can read the entire thing and you won't see a single person in it. And an emoji interpretation looks like this. Start with a city, add roads, throw in some stoplights, take out those pesky pedestrians, and voila, you've got a street with lots of speeding cars and a lot of engineers celebrating yet another job well done. Just don't try to cross that street on foot. And it's clear that our streets need an upgrade. When you think about it, so much has changed in our world in the last 60 years. Economically, politically, socially, technologically. And yet, our streets have remained virtually unchanged. You know, it's like they were coated in amber. It's like they're Jurassic Park streets. And the thing that we can do, which would be amazing, right? Wouldn't it be incredible if we just take an app and just sort of like hit it? Oh, safer streets. Mm, let's add some benches and plazas. Or maybe some bike lanes. Or maybe bus lanes, right? Making it easier to walk or bike or take transit. And the problem is, is that our streets really don't come with an app. The closest thing to an app that we had was Mike Bloomberg. And he drafted this Plan YC agenda, which was looking at how we were going to accommodate the million more people that were expected to move to New York City by 2030 and still improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods and business districts. And this Plan YC long-range sustainability plan didn't start out as a long-range plan. It actually started off in an exercise that Dan Doctoroff and his team did to look at where we were going to site a lot of the operational uh, components of the city. So where are we going to put sanitation depots? Where are we going to put truck depots for paving? All of that. And it was an eye-opening um, exercise because it look, we looked at how we were using these spaces and it was clear that we were going to have to use our spaces differently. It was a very profound exercise. And it had deeply profound implications for how we use our streets, right? We're not going to accommodate a million more people in New York City by tripling, triple decking our roads, right? We needed to make it easier for people to take the bus, to bike, to walk around, to be safe walking around. And we created 400 miles of bike lanes, plazas, all that kind of stuff, which was the sort of short version. And the slightly longer version is that it was a fight. Every day was a fight to change the culture of New York City. And we were fighting to give people more choices for getting around. And I learned some lessons along the way. And the first is that you can paint the city you want to see. It doesn't take millions of dollars. It doesn't take years and years of planning studies. And you can accomplish a lot with just the materials that you have on hand. So shortly after I started, um, we worked um, to create the first pedestrian plaza in Brooklyn, and we turned it from a place that people parked to a place that people wanted to be. And again, did it over a weekend, just with paint, tables and chairs, and planters. And we showed people what the possibilities were for their streets. And we made these transformations all over town. So this is 14th Street, which had this completely outdated traffic pattern on it. You know, this was a reverse bus lane that was here. And now we created space for people. So people are now in the space 3 a.m., 3 p.m., all times of the day and night. An Apple store moved next door. You guys have probably been there. We moved north to Madison Square. Um, this used to be, this crossing used to be the, the largest crosswalk uh, in New York City. It was larger than a football field. And it was a real problem. We had three streets coming together. It was like this whole tangle of traffic. And so we redesigned the street and we created 65,000 square feet of new public space. And it was really interesting. People are so hungry for public space in New York City. Right when we put out the orange barrels, people just came to the space. Like this art class, two hours after we closed the space, this art class was sketching in the street. Right? The only question that I have is why are they, that aren't they sketching the Flatiron Building? You know, like, what are you looking at, people? Right? So, anyway. Um, today, it is, it is one of the most successful public spaces in the city. And people will sit in the plaza rather than the park next door, Madison Square Park, just to feel the pulse of the city. So after creating a showcase of projects around the city, uh, and show what's possible on city streets, we took our toolkit to the crossroads 
of the world, Times Square. And as all of you know, Manhattan's on a grid, Broadway cuts a diagonal through it, does great things by creating public spaces and plazas, but it also creates these, you know, these hot spots of congestion, right? And Times Square was a particular problem because you had 350,000 people walking through Times Square every day. They were 90% of the traffic, but they only had 10% of the space. So this was a basic math problem. And people had tried for years and years to fix it by coming up with slip lanes or changing the signalization of the streetlights to try to make it work better. So nothing worked. So we brought this idea to Mayor Mike Bloomberg that we were going to try something new. We were going to close Broadway from 42nd to 47th Street, close it to cars and open it to people. And we were going to do it as a pilot program. We were going to test it and measure it and see if it worked. And if it worked, we would keep it. And if it didn't work, we'd put it back to the way that it was, right? So I brought this idea to Mike Bloomberg, and we're up there in, in uh, City Hall, the Committee of the Whole Room. There's this huge table. It looks like a Knights of the Round Table table, right? And all the deputy mayors were there. And so uh, uh, the mayor went around and asked all the deputy mayors what they thought about this idea, right? It was kind of like a vote. And oh, I forgot to mention, this was during his reelection campaign. So not everybody, let's just say, thought that it was a very good idea. And so by the time the poll was done, the mayor turned to me and he said, and my heart at this point was sinking because it was clear that this was not going to happen. And the mayor turned to me and he said, you know, I don't ask my commissioners to do the right thing according to the political calendar. I ask my commissioners to do the right thing, period. And he shook my hand and he said, let's do it, which was this awesome moment. Everybody say no. Yeah, nobody, nobody thought this was a great idea. Um, or at least at that time, right? Like, oh, just wait, no, do it later. Anyway, so we did it, you know, and people came out immediately. And one of the other pieces um, to know, because all of you are studying planning and you're going to be doing this kind of work going forward, I hope, I hope the future transportation commissioner for New York City is in this room. So I'm telling you, whoever you are, the next future transportation commissioner, that when you get into trouble, because every project has trouble, no project goes through the process and t comes out perfectly. So for us, one of our big issues was when we put the orange barrels out the night before we were closing Times Square uh, to cars and opening it to people, we realized there was nothing in the space. We created two and a half acres of new public space, but there was nothing there. We got to do something. So we ran to Pinchick Hardware Store in Brooklyn and bought hundreds and hundreds of beach chairs. And we put the beach chairs out. And I got to tell you, the thing that the reporters reported on and everybody talked about the next day was the beach chairs. Did you like the beach chairs? The color of the beach chairs? Nobody talked about the fact that we closed Times Square to cars. They just talked about beach chairs. So I'm telling you, when you have a big project that's controversial, I just want you to think beach chairs. And you can see today the space is used for all sorts of different things. I don't know if any of you have done the yoga classes, the Sunrise Yoga classes there. It's amazing. People have proposed all sorts of fantastic uses. And it's important to note that all of these projects, these temporary projects, went through the capital construction process, right? And it was important to demonstrate them because if, if we had gone through the traditional process, we would still be talking about closing Times Square instead of enjoying it the way we are today. A big focus of our work was data. I worked for a data-driven mayor. And as he likes to say, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. So we brought lots and lots of data. And we spent time measuring the impact of our work, which went way beyond just what was happening with traffic speeds. We looked at the mobility benefits. We looked at the safety benefits. Tracked you know, what was happening, not just curb to curb, but what was happening at the cash register. And these detailed analytics really helped make the case, particularly for small business owners, that turned from some of our biggest opponents into some of our biggest supporters. And not surprisingly, we found that you know, when we put down um, protected bike lanes, we saw streets and businesses saw a 50% increase in retail sales along the corridor, which really isn't su surprising when you think about it because cars don't shop, people do. 
And so when you make it easier for people to get to their stores, right, that has a net benefit to the local businesses. We saw the same results with our plazas. We saw the same results with our uh, bus lanes. But economics aside, there is nothing that's more important than safety. And we used data from 7,000 crashes. It was the largest um, traffic safety study ever funded by the Federal Highway uh, Administration to look at what was happening on our streets, where people were dying, when they were dying, how they were dying. And we did this because we knew that with leadership and analysis that these traffic crashes could be predicted and they could be prevented. And now we're seeing this idea explode across uh, the country with Vision Zero, which builds on this idea. And it brings me to another point, that great ideas cross borders, and that no one has a pa patent on pavement. Every, every city is different. You know, They all have their own challenges. But we all face some of the same problems. And so when you see something that you think works other places, you can try it out on your own streets. And that worked for me. I went to Bogota uh, and Curitiba uh, shortly after our, I was appointed and saw the incredible sort of mobility magic that they were bringing to their streets where, you know, trips, bus trips that used to take hours then um, taking uh, minutes. And it was a great model for New York City. Why? Because we have the largest bus fleet in no North America and we have the slowest bus speeds, as you all probably know. Right? My chief engineer used to say that the only way to get across town was to be born there, which is really not a good model for a world-class city. And so we imported the concept. Um, we created off-board fare collection, dedicated lanes. We gave buses the green light when they hit an intersection with transit signal prioritization. Um, we created seven lines over six years in all five boroughs. So again, you can move quickly. Uh, to transform your streets. And we did, we brought a very similar approach to our bike lane program. How many of you ride bikes? Okay, so you've all seen the difference that this can make. Um, we, I actually took a trip to Copenhagen um, and I was amazed at what I saw because what they did is that they just basically took the parking lane and moved it out and they created a protected lane for cyclists. And again, this doesn't cost a lot of money, right? It's just about imagining your streets a little differently. Pushing the parking lane out there did two things. One, created this amazing safe passage for cyclists and also preserved parking. And for any of you that um, are engaged in parking issues, you know that you take away a parking space and it is like taking away somebody's firstborn child, right? It is that much of a flashpoint. So this was really a win-win. And you can see this is the um, map of bike lanes in 2007, and this is the bike lane map in 2013, and I love this because it just looks so easy. No problem there. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're seeing an explosion of protected bike lanes all across uh, the country. But it is not just about moving people by bikes. It is about um, moving people. And by following their footsteps, you can see the possibilities that are hidden in plain sight. Whether it's the need for a mid-block crossing, this is on uh, 51st between uh, 6th and 7th Avenue where we sort of channeled a little Harry Potter and created 6th and a half Avenue. Um, yes, we thought that Seth came up with that. Um, or the need for a sidewalk that was basically written in the grass. Or the need for um, public space, um, creating plazas. And importantly, we turned many of our programs into application-based programs. So people could apply for street seating, they could apply for bike racks, they could apply for bike lanes. And that was an important change in the relationship that people had with government, right? They could ask for the changes that they wanted to see on their streets. And at the end of the Bloomberg administration, you had a, a tsunami of demands from across the city from communities that wanted these different changes. And it was a really important moment because it doesn't matter then who's the mayor or who's the transportation commissioner. It is the people that are demanding change on their streets. We also worked with local artists to bring new life to old spaces, sculptures to places like Madison Square, lighting on places like the Manhattan Bridge, even the lowly Jersey barriers, got a makeover, working with community groups 
across the city. Has anybody participated in the Summer Streets program? Right? Summer Streets is a great program. You guys should check it out. Uh, summer Saturdays. Um, and we close Park Avenue, s seven miles of uh, car-free streets, um, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., programming, dancing, all sorts of fun stuff. This is an example of one of the things we did. We uh, closed the Park Avenue tunnel to cars, invited an artist to come in through a competition who created this sound and light show that was really extraordinary. Again, just imagining our streets can be used a little bit differently. And in a city where this actually passed as public seating, right, which is really not great for people or parents or anybody really, um, we added thousands of new benches. And I think you were talking about the street furniture, um, which made me smile. Um, and we asked New Yorkers where, they, where we should put them. So again, it was an application-based program um, that we used on uh, making it easier for people to walk and sit and take in the city. We also started a system of wayfinding that you've seen. You know, we had a great system of signs for cars, but not a great system of signs for people on foot. And you know, we did this survey before we started this, and we found out that at any given point in time, 10% of New Yorkers were lost, right? And that's just the New Yorkers that would admit it, right? So we knew we had a problem. And this was a way to make it easier for New Yorkers to get around. The public domain is the public's domain. And they will do, as you know, anything they can to protect it, to keep it, put it back the way that it was. So a city government that's looking to do big things will naturally have a kind of push-pull relationship with these groups. And building those relationships is as important as anything that you put down in concrete, asphalt, or steel. And there is a growing coalition of New Yorkers that are passionate about taking back their streets, fighting to take them back. And there's a great set of advocates that are doing just that. And I can't say enough for the advocates that we worked at that helped us make this change happen. Eric McClure, Paul Steely White from Transportation Alternatives, Brad Lander in the City Council, Clarence Eckerson in, in Street Films. I mean, really amazing people. You needed to have that push to help us get over the line. And building relationships, new ways of engaging stakeholders, very, very important. Um, somebody, a couple of people you may know here, lots of ways to engage, right? And so we look for innovative techniques to get that done. But it wasn't always easy. There were bumps in the road. You know, I learned that when you push the status quo, the status quo pushes back hard. Anybody know the street? You will get a free copy of Street Fight if you say it right now. No, you don't count. What street is this? Huh? Central Park East? No. Who said that? Who said that? You don't count either. Did somebody else say Prospect Park West? Nobody said Prospect Park West. Wow. Prospect Park West. Well, you're going to have to. All right. Wow, that's amazing. OK. Yes, I think that will count for you then. I think that will count for you. You really did know where it was. So this was Prospect Park West. This was actually ground zero in the bike lane fight. Um, the community asked us to fix it. It was a dangerous speedway next to the park. You know, it was like a, you know, a tarmac with like jets taken off. It was just like the light went green and cars sped. Cyclists were so scared of the street that they rode on the sidewalk. So the community asked us to fix it, put it in a two-way bike lane, which we did, made the sidewalks. You know, speeding went down 75%. Nobody's on the sidewalk anymore. It was great, right? Everybody's so happy because this happened and this worked. Turns out, not so much. So these protesters came out complaining that somehow because we made the street slower, it made the street less safe, right? And a local paper got really into it. They, they, start, they said that this was the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip, right? <laughs> Amazing. And you can see what they found so threatening. I mean, who would want to live next to a scene like this? And it led to this full-blown backlash. 
right? But you need to stand your ground and not make policy based on the press. And when we launched the city bike program, um, it's now 12,000 bikes. People have taken over 50 million rides. We knew it would be popular, but we also knew that we would be criticized along the way. And a local magazine analyzed just why City Bike elicited such strong reactions. New Yorkers didn't like anything healthy, that involved sharing, that was environmental, or my favorite, anything that was vaguely French. And the tipping point in this backlash came with this Wall Street Journal uh, editor. Uh, she called us bike craze. She said that we were advoc that we were working with the advocates, part of this all-powerful bike lobby, working hand in hand with this totalitarian mayor. I got very, she got very exercised. You can probably still find it on YouTube. But my hero, John Stewart, told it like it was. <laughs> right there, John. Bikes lady. And I think backlash is a sign that you are doing something right. It is what happens when you challenge the status quo and you move to a new road order. And today, the typical rider looks much more like the guy on the right than the Mad Max messenger on the left. And it's a big step, bikes being used for commuting, for getting around, for errands, for getting married. I love that one. And it's popular. Um, people are way ahead of the press and politicians when it comes to their street. At the last poll taken at the end of the Bloomberg administration, we found a 73% support for bike share, 72% support for plazas, 64% support for bike lanes. If this had been an election, it would have been a landslide. And we saw just how much had changed. Uh, a few years ago when the de Blasio administration thought it would be a good idea to take out the Times Square plazas to deal with the scantily clad women and costume characters that were soliciting tips from tourists. And it did not go over well. Once the idea was floated, New Yorkers rushed to defend their plazas. I mean, I was getting all geared up to start to defend it, and it didn't matter. Like, the people were completely in a new place about this. And it was amazing because you think, you know, just a few years earlier, people were outraged that we were taking cars out of Times Square. And now, um, few can imagine putting them back. It's truly a new status quo. And it's amazing how far New York City and other uh, cities have come um, in, in implementing these kinds of opportunities. Um, and a big buzz that's happening right now is how new technology is going to revolutionize our cities, and it's right around the corner. And there's a lot to like. If we can connect vehicles to the worldwide street you know, and eliminate the 40,000 traffic deaths that we see every year, um, that would be great. You know? And seen this way, we shouldn't be afraid of driverless cars. We should be afraid of the ones that we already have. Uh, the only problem with this future is that there are no people in it. If you Google AVs, you will see images of hundreds of people chilling in cars, just chilling in cars. And it looks like if you get driverless cars, you also get peopleless streets. I mean, or this token kid playing with a soccer ball underneath this multi-lane highway. I don't know what that is. Um, but if this looks familiar, it's because we've already seen this movie. You know, it was a sort of technicolor fantasy before. You know, people sipping cappuccino um, and they're kind of Logan's Run turtlenecks. And today the fantasy still is automatic cars and these people in the blue turtlenecks. I mean, I really don't know what it is with these blue turtlenecks, but they are there. I urge you to check it out. Um, although this version has more of a sort of Xanax and chill kind of vibe to it, I think, don't you? <laughs> right? So, but this driverless fantasy is this kind of fugue state. Um, and we're too busy daydreaming that we don't realize that may, we may be driving ourselves back to the same dead end uh, as the last century. Because a driverless car is still a car. You may know, some of you may know this image, you know, how much space is taken up by 60 people in cars versus on a bus or on a bike. And my colleague John Orcott 
show that AVs aren't going to solve the problem if people just trade in uh, their personal cars and take Ubers, right? You're just changing the kind of car that you see on the street. And the point of shared driverless mobility isn't to have better cars. It's to have better cities. And we need a vision to establish um, these principles before we make decisions that we can't undo. And that's why the new guides that NACTO put out, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, is so important. And Sky Duncan and Kita and Fabio all deserve a tremendous amount of credit. You know, they, uh, Sky leads the Global Designing Cities Initiative, which is the global arm of NACTO. And these guides are literally changing facts on the ground in cities around the world. Why? Even in the United States, you know, we had this design guidance that I talked about before that was 60 years old. And so cities didn't want to make changes because they didn't, they were scared that they'd be liable for the changes. They were scared they'd lose federal money. And now the urban street design guide at the top has been adopted by USDOT and Federal Highway as new design guidance. It is giving cities a new permission slip to change their streets. And there's a transit street design guide and a bikeway design guide and the global street design guide. And I can't tell you what a huge difference that is making for cities and mayors around the world. And it builds on work that we've seen in cities around the world, whether it's Vancouver, um, whether in LA, and you know there's a seismic shift happening in LA when we've got uh, protected lanes there. Um, in Toronto, you can see the changes. In Bogota, we've been working with Mayor Penulosa. Um, there, Addis Ababa, Sky and her team literally um, painting the streets overnight there working with communities. We're working in Athens to reclaim spaces uh, for people on foot. In Paris, you probably read about the pedestrianization efforts underway there. Uh, in Mumbai, same thing with the work through GDCI and Santiago. You know, cities are seeing what's possible when they look at their assets differently. What the potential that's there that is hidden in plain sight. Because as we know, it is not a question of engineering. It is a question of imagination. And we know it's a fight to make space for people. It's a street fight. But it's a fight that we can win. It's a fight that we must win. Because when you change the street, you change the world. Thank you. So we're going to do questions? Yeah. Lower Manhattan. Financial yep. yep. We actually did some work on that, and um, uh, Polly Trottenberg, the, new tr the Transportation Commissioner, is continuing that work, and I'm hopeful that we'll actually be able to see something like that happen in the next few years. Yeah. Well, I mean, you sort of see that in Hunts Point and the Bronx, and I mean, there's lots of. It's yeah, it's. There's a specific design model about how an industrial area can deal with the conflicts between trucks and people and parking, and we design more in favor of the industrial Yeah, uh, there's the design guidance that I'm talking about has provisions in all of it for all different types of uses and all t different types of vehicles. So that's embedded in the work that's there. But so much of the challenge is actually getting pedestrians to an, a level playing field, right? And, but, 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 you know, every city, every, every environment's different. And so, you know, you have to tailor the designs to work in a particular area. But the truck piece is, is, is embedded in the design guidance. Yeah? Thanks. Thank you.
Yes. Well, I helped write it, so I think it's an awesome guide, and I encourage you to get a copy of it as soon as possible. All right, excellent. I mean, it's it's really important because you know, it's 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 uncertain what's happening right now, and so cities really need to get back into the driver's seat on this before these changes happen without them. And a big piece of this is not only the sort of what happens in an analog situation on the streets, although this design guide is pointing in this direction and the policy considerations that need to be taken into account. But as, as importantly, what are we doing to map the streets of the future? Because when we're talking about a, a, autonomous sort of robot cars on the streets, they have to read the street differently, right? And so what's happening is the map of the street, the digital map of the street is, is really the sort of gold going forward, right? Because that's what everybody's fighting over. And so there are a lot of entities, Google's one of them, that actually would like to own the map and sell it, sell that information back to cities. And it's our belief that cities, that that asset belongs to cities, right? And so the Shared Streets platform, which is work underway through NACTO and an organization called OTP, is, and I encourage you to look up shared streets, is actually looking at a way for the public and the private sector to share information about what's happening on the street, right? So you've seen what's happening with Uber and Lyft on the streets of New York City, right? Tripling of the amount of cars on the streets of this city, right? And yet, nobody gets information, you know, decision makers don't get information about what's happening in the street. New York does actually because of um, Mira Yoshi at TLC is doing an awesome job of collecting that information and working with these private sector players. But in most cities, the transportation department or the planning department don't actually have access to this information because they won't share it. And they won't share it for three reasons. They say the first reason is they don't want to compromise the privacy of their customers. I could go on with that. All of you could go on with that given recent events. Two, they don't want to share the data because they don't want to give their competitors an advantage. And three, and I love this one, they don't want to share it with city agencies because they wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. And so what the Shared Streets platform does, it's a way for cities to actually say, no, here's a platform that you can use to share data that's anonymized, that's aggregated, does not affect privacy, competitive advantage, and by the way, we know how to use the information. And so a coalition of cities are coming together to push for this shared streets um, platform and to um, encourage, if not mandate, um, private sector players to use this so that we're not planning blind in the future, right? We need to know what's happening on our streets, and that's a critical tool to allow us to get there. So it's both the design guidance in the blueprint and then also creating a sort of digital commons for our streets that are shared by everyone. Probably more than you wanted, but yeah. Yes, well, um, I wrote part of the Tolling the East River Bridges report when I worked for Mayor Dinkins in 1990, and then I worked for Mayor Bloomberg where we tried to pass the congestion pricing program. So I feel deeply strongly about it for only about 27 years. So I am hopeful that we will get there because it, it, this is not optional, right? As you all know, our subway system is falling apart. You know, uh, I mean, I was lucky I got here on time today taking the train, but I could have been half an hour late. And that's just not acceptable uh, in a world-class city. Our system has now got 58% on-time performance, right? That's just pathetic. So we need to find dedicated revenue streams to do it. And with congestion pricing, you can deal with the demand side of the equation and you can fund the MTA, so it's a win-win. Um, I do think that the name congestion pricing is a bit unfortunate. It marries together two Names that everybody hates, congestion and pricing, right? Terrible. The marketing of that was terrible. So I like the new marketing campaign, which is Move New York, right? Move New York. And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of technology that's out there that can get us beyond, you know, easy pass technology. Um, so I'm hoping it's a matter of uh, when and not if. But, you know, Albany is always a surprise.
Well, they're part of the, all those cities are part of the same coalition that's working toward that goal. And so whether it's a shared vision about the designs that we want to see on our streets, whether it's a shared vision of the information flow on our streets, whether it's, um, I mean, it's a way also for transportation commissioners and planners and people that are passionate about it to come together to talk about what works and what doesn't and share that kind of information. And so, you know, those cities are also on the AV side, there was a Bloomberg Aspen AV initiative that involved 10 cities working through um, both the design piece, the sort of policy implications about who's served, um, and, and the financing piece and all of the rest of that. And so I encourage you to go on site. There's actually a really good site that um, maps all of the different cities that are doing pilot projects in AV and sort of goes through the description of what they are. So, but it's early days. And so it only, it, your point is a good one because it's, it's really important that everybody's sharing information right now and sharing and having a shared sense of what they want. What's the future we want to see? We're not just planning the car, we're planning the future we want to see. And that's a critical change in terms of how we're envisioning how this new technology uh, operates on our streets. Well, they already have. Right. Um, so, I mean, from a policy perspective, how would you try to mitigate that? Like, I would cap the number of, right now on TNCs, I would cap the number of TNCs without question. Um, and so we really need to be thoughtful about the decisions that we're making now and not just, you know, there are cities that are kind of rushing, they want to be the next smart city, you know, and mayors think, oh, I want to be smart, you know, test out all your ideas on our streets and, you know, you have to be really careful. You, Tempe, you know, we just saw what happened with Ms. Hertzberg and when we're not paying attention to some of the issues that come down the line and we're not regulating them. Even the bill that, you know, Congress was considering allows a three to five year period of time for testing of AVs, that window where there's no guidance in place whatsoever. That's like we are going to be guinea pigs on the street, right? In what world is that a good idea? Don't quote me on that, but this is all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's a, in fact there's a whole piece on resiliency and there's also a, a stormwater um, guide that just came out that's focused also on that as well and looking at ways to build in resiliency to our existing infrastructure programs. It's critical. It's critical. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a critical issue. You know, if you create, you know, world-class infrastructure, it needs to be maintained um, and taken care of, right? Um, one of the ways that I worked um, this issue through under uh, Mayor Bloomberg was working with the police commissioner on these initiatives. And so we would do kind of SWAT team targeted enforcement blitzes to send drivers the message that they can't park in these lanes. And so, you know, you have 35,000 police officers that are engaged in public safety in any number of ways, so you can't have like a whole force doing just that. But you can use, you know, targeted efforts to, to send a message that this is unacceptable behavior. And I think that's one important way of, in, of making sure that, that these streets are protected and used for the purpose that they were put in for. Mm -hmm. There's no mechanism to enforce, I understand, to enforce Con Edison or whatever comes in, comes up the street to replace it as it was. 
So that's, uh, that's, that's almost like a planted question. Um, <laughs> I feel so strongly about this. So um, there's a street cut in New York City every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds, the street is cut into. 6,000 miles of streets, that's a lot of street cuts. And what ends up happening is these uh, private utilities will cut into the street and they will say it's an emergency, right? And they don't, um, so they don't follow protocol. One of the first things that I did as commissioner was to create this street works manual, which was basically doping out who cut into the street, how they cut into the street, when they cut into the street, all of this was, it was a three year effort. Um, it was, you know, it was exhausting, but really important work. Was, I, I'm surprised I actually, it's a good point, I should put this in the presentation. Anyway, um, what we did is we got agreement with all of the entities that touched the street that they were gonna follow a certain protocol. And what we had found when we first did this was that they too didn't wanna share the information about where they were making cuts into the street for customers, because they felt that that gave their competitors an advantage knowing where they were and who they were serving and all of that. So we created this data island that made it possible for them to share this information, you know, without, you know, compromising their, you know, competition, competitive advantage. And so that worked um, for a while. And we tripled the fines for people that, you know, cut into the street illegally. And so at the beginning, that was good, but to your point, it takes a tremendous amount of enforcement, and it's difficult to have the boots on the ground to do the enforcement that you need there, but it is critical. And similarly on the maintenance side, and the problem in so many cities too is that, you know, everybody gets a big rush from cutting the ribbon on a new project, right? But you don't get like a big press conference when you're like, I'm maintaining the street, right? I mean, we need to give you know, more tender loving care and appreciation for the kind of street maintenance work that needs to get done. Um, and in New York City, we had a, a very healthy capital and maintenance program um, that we worked very, very hard on to make sure that the streets were in a state of good repair. I don't think any of these changes would have happened if we hadn't taken care of the basics. And the basics is, is everything from filling potholes, fixing signs and street lights, um, and bridges, um, but your point is a good one, that the maintenance side of new mobility needs to include the maintenance component. Um, and so I think it's, I, I, I've seen great work from the New York City Department of Transportation, I can't say enough for I think the good work that they do in a very difficult environment where people are cutting up the street all the time. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of um, possibilities, and um, there are fairly uh, strong players on the government scene, um, but I think it's a great idea. I mean, anything we can do to ensure that our streets are taken care of and that the people that are making changes in them are responsible for putting them back to the way that they were. I mean, we created a program where it used to be that like somebody would cut into the street and then they would like, you know, fix up their other part of the street. Even the whole street was like messed up. And so we created a whole, like if you were going to touch the street, you're going to, you're going to fix the entire street. You're not just going to fix this little piece of it. We also created a program where we created protected streets where you can't touch a street for 10 years, you know, unless it really is an emergency because we've just done an entire um, rebuilding program, resurfacing. Um, reconstruction uh, of that street. And I think taking that kind of an approach, the, I have this fantasy um, that we'll be able to uh, implement a program that is, is in uh, Tokyo, in Japan, where they actually have, their streets are broken up so that if you have to get underneath it, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, you just pull it up, right? It's such a great way to go. Of course, the cost for that initially, maybe the bond could go for that. But that's a great idea. Is there a question over here? Yeah. How do we help um, smaller cities get over some of the political and resource constraints to try to implement some of these design changes? That's a great question. One of the things that we do with the Synacto network is we have affiliate cities. And so 
you know, cities of all sizes can apply, and it's a great way to sort of, we do then charrettes and trainings and go out there and, and convene all of the stakeholders. It could be sanitation, public works, transportation, planning, whatever, coming together, and we'll actually take a street in a city and, and redesign it and work with the players there, to sh to, again, to show what's possible and work through the coordination issues, the legal issues, whatever it may be. So that's been, I think, a good, good way to, to get the message out. Um, and I think you're seeing it in lots of different kinds of cities, particularly the idea of pilot projects, right? Because what you're seeing is mayors in cities of all sizes want to be able to show that they've done something on their watch, right? And since capital projects are generally five years, at, at, you know, if they're going well, start to finish, this, the piloting and painting is a way for a mayor to show what's possible. And so a lot of times when I show mayors the sort of before and afters, I've got a deck of before and afters, they're like drooling because they love that idea. And then it's like, what, when, what can we do now? Let's do something, right? And so there's an excitement now that's really building um, around these kinds of interventions. Did you? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's Um, we don't have um, projects in China right now, although this is being translated into Chinese, I'm happy to say. And um, we're going to Beijing and Shanghai and uh, a number of Guangzhou, a number of cities next year. Um, but China is, a, is an incredibly important um, part of the world to focus on. And one of the other things that we've been trying to do is to get um, the World Bank and IDB to adopt the global street design standards as a condition for the award of uh, funding and so that we don't continue to repeat the mistakes of the past, right, and that we're building streets of the future that actually build in um, uses for everyone, you know, particularly important uh, in Africa uh, and, and also in China and so Sky's been a leader in trying to bring that development community together to um, bring a different sort of lens uh, to their funding arms. Yeah. Um, Seattle is doing a good job on that. Um, <laughs> Chicago did a nice job on the waterfront there. Toronto's doing some good work uh, on the waterfront. Um, but I, I think that's a study tour that we should engage in. Okay. <laughs> Uh, are electric bikes uh, perhaps as dangerous as cars because electric bikes seem to go in all directions? No. No. Should they go to 25 miles an hour though? You don't see a problem with people dying from electric bikes. You see a problem with people dying from 2,000 pound cars. Thank you very much. <laughs>